Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. I'll make arrows from your bones by Verstal. I remember the first time I caused two men to kill each other. I was seven and was waiting outside a dressing room while my mother tried on summer vacation clothes. She had told me not to move a muscle, so that's what I did. The department store was quiet, and I soon felt myself getting drowsy from the boredom and breathing in and out the same warm, recycled air. That's when I noticed two men talking nearby. At first, I thought they were friends or working together, but then I saw they were angry. They were standing on opposite sides of the checkout counter, and that seemed like the only thing keeping them from pushing or hitting each other. And then they were pushing and hitting each other. I heard someone yell from somewhere nearby, and when I looked back, I saw that one of the men had pulled a knife and was stabbing the other. As they fell down and out of view, I heard both of the men begin to scream. My mother had come out at the commotion, and without another word, she grabbed my hand and pulled me from the store. I was shaken as we walked across the parking lot to the car, but I didn't cry. I never cried in front of her. Instead, I just waited, tense and tight as a spring, for whatever my mother had to tell me. Five minutes down the road, she began, Did you see those men? I nodded from the back seat and then spoke up. Yes, ma'am, I did. She was gripping the steering wheel tight, her gold and silver rings standing out from her white fingers like strange glittering mountains on some distant hostile world. I saw her dark eyes flip up to mine in the rearview mirror. Did you see the dark cloud around them? I frowned, shaking my head. I knew my mother was a great many things. I knew a great many things. And while she could be harsh, she was never dishonest or cruel. Even when I was afraid of her, I loved her. I wanted to be like her and never disappoint her. In my heart, I considered lying, saying I'd seen the cloud around them just so I could be like her. But she would know I was lying, and it would make her angry. Worse, she would think less of me. So I kept shaking my head as I answered, No, ma'am. She nodded, her eyes unreadable. Well, that may be for the best. It was a terrible thing to see. It was a dark cloud that made those men fight and have a lust for killing. Just a little thing swimming around the two of them. But that's not the worst part. She let out a deep breath. No, the worst part was I saw a black string of it trailing back towards us, like the string on a balloon, trailing all the way back to my sweet little girl. I remember feeling so scared then, so ashamed. It wasn't the first time my mother had told me secret, hidden things that she saw, or the first time she had hinted there was something wrong with me. But even at that young age, I understood how her mind worked, the meanings and implications of what was said and left unsaid. Normally, I just kept that all to myself, but this time I just couldn't. I had to know. Mama, was that cloud coming from me? She closed her eyes for a second, and when she reopened them, I saw her mascara smudged from the tears welling in the corner of her eyes. 
I'm afraid so, honey. You made those nice men fight. Maybe kill each other. We rode on in silence for several minutes then. The only sounds the road beneath us and my mother sniffling. I still wasn't crying or even afraid. There was a terrible inevitability to it all that made sense. As though my inherent badness had finally grown so strong, it had spilled out into the outer world. I looked back at Mama's face in the mirror. Am I going to hurt more people? And then, at the panicked thought, I added, Am I going to hurt you with this cloud? Mama favored me with a watery smile. I hope not, honey. I'll do what I can to stop it. She was suddenly slowing down the car until we were stopped dead in the road a few miles from home. Turning around, she looked at me intently, her face no longer smiling, but not unkind. But don't you worry, baby. I won't leave you, and I'll do my best to keep everyone safe from you. Six months later, Mama woke me up to tell me that the world was ending. I hadn't been back to school since that day in the department store, and aside from Mama, the only person I had seen was the mailman when he stuck his arm out to put the mail in the box. She told people I was being homeschooled, but for the most part I was left to my own devices as long as I stayed inside. The house was huge, and even growing up there, I felt like there was always something new to explore in a forgotten room or a dusty corner of the library. I loved books already, and once the outside world was foreclosed to me, they became my only real friends, aside from Mama. I would carry them through the shadowy halls of the old family house, whispering secrets to them and holding them up to my ear like a seashell to see if they would answer. They never did, of course, but I didn't hold that against them. I knew sometimes it was best to stay quiet. The night the world ended, Mama carried me down to the lower basement. It had been fashioned into a storm cellar decades earlier, with a heavy metal door and rooms set aside for storing food and water. I'd always been intrigued by my earlier glimpses of it, but now I was afraid. When she pulled me inside and twisted the door handle shut, I felt my stomach clenching. What's happening, Mama? She was dressed up like always, wrapped in a green cocktail dress and glittering with jewels. From behind, she looked like she had just gotten home from attending some fancy party or hosting an elaborate dinner. She was even holding her little metal box like a tiny purse or model an actress might carry. But when she turned to look at me, her face was pale and drawn, with makeup caked and running into thick, melting mud of sweat and tears. In the unforgiven sodium lights of our little underground bunker, she looked like a monster when she told me of the death of our world. It was your cloud, honey. It was such a terrible thing. I thought if I kept you hidden away, you wouldn't be able to hurt anybody. She shuffled over to one of the two small metal beds, stuffed against the walls of the front room of the storm cellar. Her eyes were distant, and her lips trembled as she sat down unsteadily on the edge of the mattress. Ah, I, I started hearing news stories and gossip about people fighting, killing each other. At first, I hoped it was just normal evil that people had done to one another, that my safeguards were keeping everyone safe from you and your little cloud. Leaning forward, she bit her knuckles on her clenched hands. But I was stupid, and I supposed I always knew in my heart of hearts. Then just today, I saw it when I went into town. It was almost as big as the sky, 
and I saw people fighting in the streets, going crazy, turning to stare at me with her wide raccoon eyes. Her voice cracked with emotion. It's only a matter of a time before they figure out it's coming from you. And then they'll come for you, those that are left. That's why we have to stay down here where it's safe. In a few months, everything will be settled one way or another, and we can go back outside, try to make a life in whatever world is left. Mama smiled weakly. I know it won't be fun, but if we're careful, we have enough food and water to last a year down here. I've been getting ready just in case. I went over to her, hugged her, both to comfort and to be comforted. I was so ashamed and guilty for all the bad I had done without even realizing it. But what I hated the most was I was putting Mama through. She already had so much on her with her special side. She had foreseen Daddy dying weeks before it happened, and she'd known since I was a baby that something wasn't right with me. But she always stuck by me, forgiving me, protecting me. I squeezed her tightly, my heart thudding with fear and sadness, but most of all, love. It was hours later when I was still softly crying in some twilight realm of not sleep that I felt her crouched in the darkness next to my new bed. I felt her hand lightly on my head, gently stroking my hair as she murmured to me, Nothing to worry about, baby girl. I've seen what needs to be done. We're going to stop this bad old cloud. Looking up from my tear-stained pillow, I stared at her, voice in the dark. How? Well, I'm going to wait a few days, and then I'm going to head up into the house, into the attic. Your father's old bow is up there somewhere. With it, I can try and kill the cloud, or at least drive it off. What she was saying made no sense, but she seemed so certain. How do you know that, Mama? I heard the rasp of metal on concrete as she reached down to find the small box in the inky black surrounding us and giving it an affectionate pat. Of course, the box. She had seen something in it. That was part of how she got her visions, and while I'd never been allowed to touch or look into the box myself, I knew how powerful it was. It was what had first shown her I had something wrong with me when I was just a little baby. The box of shadows, dear. It shows me the way. I could have left it there. I knew the rhythms of conversation with my mother well enough to know when she was satisfied. And I could have just let that silence stretch out until she was tired enough to go back to bed. But I wanted to show her how much I cared, that I was a smart little girl and wanted to help, even if I had wickedness in me. So I sent one more question out into the dark. Where are you gonna get the arrows for the bow, Mama? Her breath was hot on my neck as she leaned close, crooning the words into my ear as she began stroking my hair again. Why, from your bones, my heart, I'll make my arrows from your bones. Part Two I didn't sleep that night. At first I was frozen with fear to even think about closing my eyes or moving at all. My brain felt like jelly, and my thoughts were dull and ponderous, sliding past each other in a congealed dark of my mind. I remember thinking that I was turning to stone, and that was all right. I would just turn to stone, and then it wouldn't hurt when Mama came to rip me apart. But the thought didn't last, didn't satisfy. Soon I was replaced with a new, stranger idea that I liked better. The idea that if I was still enough, not moving a muscle or making a sound, 
I would just fade into the background until I disappeared like a ghost. Once I was invisible, I could move around without Mama noticing. I could try to help her, and if I couldn't, I could try to escape. But I was still fearful of what the world had become outside our little shelter. But I was also starting to doubt of what she had told me. If she was sick or confused, maybe things weren't like she thought after all. Hours passed with me staying still, barely breathing enough to stir my chest. It felt as though I could feel myself fading away from the world, growing thin and insubstantial before slipping away entirely into some ghost version of the storm shelter. Breathing a little more deeply, the only sound I heard was the placid snoring of Mama across the room. I eased off the bed an inch at a time. Twice the unfamiliar springs beneath me creaked and my heart shuddered in my chest. Both times Mama stopped snoring for a moment before the familiar drone of her sleeping began again. My bare feet were silent on the cold concrete floor as I crept in what I thought was the direction of the door leading out. My initial thoughts had evolved into a rudimentary plan. I would sneak outside, see how things looked, and if there was help to be gotten, I would get it for myself and for Mama. If everything was as bad as she said, I could always turn around before she even missed me. But when I twisted the doorknob, I found it was locked. With no way of unlocking it, except for the small keyhole I felt under the knob. Biting my lip, I turned back to stare unseeing in the direction of Mama. She would have the key somewhere, probably on her body, in a pocket, or on a chain. I might wake her up trying to find it, but I might not. She was sleeping hard, and besides, what other choice did I have? So I made my way back in the direction I'd come, following the sound of her snores to guide me to the side of her bed. Every step I was scared I would bump into something or fall, make some noise that would wake her and rouse her suspicion. But I reached her easily and, crouching down beside her, I sent out a trembling, questing hand. She had changed into pajamas of some sort, and at first I wondered if there were any pockets at all. I was drifting my hands over her lightly, light as the spring breeze, trying to sense the geography of her clothing without waking her. It wasn't working very well. I had no point of reference in the dark, and I hadn't paid attention to what she was wearing before she put me to bed. Just as I was losing hope, I felt a hard lump on what I guessed was her hip. It was Mama's box of shadows. She had had the box for as long as I remembered. She told me once it had been in the family for some time, and that it was always passed down to the eldest child, which she was, when they were grown. Mama said one day it would be mine, but that until then, I was never to touch it or look in it. Such things, she said, weren't meant for me yet. They could ruin someone so young. As with everything, I'd taken Mama at her word, worked to do as she wanted, and while I still had curiosity about it, for the most part, I had learned to act as though it didn't exist. But I was not an idiot either. I knew the box had shown her terrible things, had affected her, making her strange, especially in the hours and days after she used it. When I was smaller, she had looked into it very infrequently. But within the past months, I'd seen her with it more and more. And every time she used it, she came back to herself a little less. It was as if she was leaving some part of her sanity 
or her soul in that thing every time she looked into it, trying to see what? I didn't know. Possible futures and how to avoid them. Hidden knowledge from some distant, forgotten place. She rarely talked about what she saw, but it was clearly important given how it captivated her. The thought didn't occur to me at the time that she was an addict. An addict hungry for whatever poison that box offered. At the time, I just thought about how I needed to see what was in that box for myself. So I could try and understand. So I could try to help Mama. I carefully reached into her pocket for the box. It was icy to the touch, but not unpleasantly so. And after one gentle tug, it slid easily out into my hand. I froze again for a moment. Still snoring? Yes, at least for now. But I needed to be quick. Standing up slowly, I crept away from the bed. My free hand stuck out in front of me. I needed the door to the storage rooms. I could look at the box in there. I went too far at first, but when I came back in the other direction, I found it. I sat down after I was through the doorway. If Mama decided to turn on the lights, I'd be around the corner out of sight. Feeling the box with my hands, I found the small metal door on the top of it. I knew from watching Mama that all you needed to do was trigger the door with a tiny button on the side and two small glass windows would be revealed. Then you simply held the box up to your eyes and looked through those windows into whatever it was. It showed. It hadn't occurred to me growing up how insane the idea of the box was. Perhaps because I'd never known life without it. Questions like how it was powered. How did it work? How could it possibly work? Those things never crossed my mind. In part because I'd seen how it affected Mama whenever she used it. She wasn't faking it. And I hadn't thought and she was stupid or insane. So whatever the box was, whatever it could do, it had to be real, right? I triggered the button to release the lid covering the glass viewing circles. It sounded impossibly loud in the dark, and I strained to listen for the rhythmic sounds of Mama sleeping before relaxing my death grip on the box. I felt an untapped well of fear rising in me. I didn't want to see what the box would show me. I didn't want to be like Mama. Shaken badly, I opened my eyes wide and brought the box up. My eyelashes brushed against the glass lenses and I blinked as I stared into nothing. There was nothing in there. It was just dark, empty box. And my mother was just crazy. I looked up for my notes at Addison. She seemed slightly emotional now leaning forward in her seat as she spoke. I would normally take that as a welcome change from her typical flat affect and guarded body language. But something was off. Staring at the floor, Addison was wiping tears from her cheeks as she waited silently for my reaction. I took a moment to pick up her file off the table and flip back through my earlier notes from when she first started having sessions with me a year earlier. Not notes from the sessions themselves, a troubled and angry 14-year-old girl at the time. She had barely spoken to me in those first meetings. No, the notes were from things her grandparents had told me before I started counseling Addison. Ah, here we go. Addison is a sweet girl who's been through a lot. Her mother had mental health issues, which led to her isolating herself and Addison from the family. This culminated when, after two months of attempts at contacting with no response, her grandmother went to check on them 
and found Addison trapped in a sub-basement with her mother's dead body. She had been there for several days. There was some investigation into the cause of death, which was ultimately ruled a suicide. Grandmother showed signs of dishonesty during the discussion of this death and Addison's ongoing behavior. This may be partly unintentional as she seemed very protective of the girl and seemed unwilling to assign blame to Addison even after the incident at school. Looking back up from my notes, I saw that Addison was looking at me. At 15, her gaze was unnerving at times. She was highly intelligent, and while she often showed little emotion, I never got the sense it was due to any lack of feeling. Instead, I had recently began developing the theory that everything this girl did was extensively planned and tightly controlled. This could be the product of an unfortunate but charismatic young lady who was working hard to be liked and fit in, to find love and acceptance after a traumatic early childhood. Or it could be signs of a budding sociopath. When you had this realization about your mother, how did that make you feel? There was a buzz from the office phone, and then Janice's voice telling me that my three o'clock, Mr. Evans was here. I told her it would be a few minutes. I looked back to Addison and apologized for the interruption. I saw that her tears were gone now. She sat back in her chair and crossed her arms, giving a shrug. Well, not good. I had trusted her, knowing she was crazy, had been delusional or lying or whatever. It sucked. Knowing she might hurt me, that was worse. Nodding, I waited my options. I could let her continue to guide the session and retreat back to her normal posture. That would lose any real progress we might make today, especially if I was wrong and she was being genuine. Or I could try and provoke a reaction, see if I could break through to something. Did you kill your mother? Addison's expression didn't change at first. Then she smiled slightly. Why, do you think I did? I mirrored her earlier shrug. I don't know, Addison. There are details about what I've heard about your time with your mother. I flipped through the remaining pages of notes I had from her family and a childhood counselor that don't seem to match up with what you're telling me. Her smile widened. Like what? I flipped to the third page and scanned it. Like, according to your grandfather, there were never any reports of a fight or a murder at a department store near where you lived during the relevant time frame. She nodded. And what else? There's the pre-interview notes of the counselor you saw briefly. You first went to when you lived with your grandparents. According to those, she reviewed an incident report from when you were found in the sub-basement with your mother's body. That's when the police found you. You were in good condition and sitting on the front lawn. Your grandmother had gotten you out easily because the door wasn't locked. Addison crinkled her nose slightly. Couldn't it be I just remembered things differently? Trauma and all that. I tried to keep my expression neutral. It could, but in my experience, you are very intelligent and self-controlled. You don't make many mistakes. And while a traumatized seven-year-old unlocking the door and then still choosing to stay with her dead mother is feasible, it seems less likely in this case. Because I see here that you asked your grandmother about when she found you, and she said she searched the upper floors and then went down to the basement, that she found you easily enough by the smell, that the door opened right up because there was no way to lock it, never had been. 
Addison smirked at me. What else did she say? I closed the file. Addison, if you want to make progress, if you want me to reach the point where I can sign off on you having completed the mandated mental health component of your pre-trial diversion satisfactorily, I need you to be honest with me. Tell me what really happened to your mother. I felt my breath catch as her smile fell away. For the first time, I was actually afraid of her. She died and I lived. That's the only part that matters. Suddenly, her smile was back as her eyes began to dance with mischief. But if you want to know how, it's gonna cost you. I swallowed. She was trying to bait me, but how or why, I wasn't sure. I held her gaze for another moment before nodding. Sure, I want to know. How did your mother die? A small chill ran up my back as she looked at me. She was still smiling, but her eyes were no longer full of life and merriment. Instead, they looked flat and dark. Empty pools of night ringed by thin rim of dark green. Pools that were deep and filled with terrible things, ready to pull me down. I blinked. What did you say? She chuckled as she stood up. I told you I needed to go. We're over our time and your next patient is waiting. I rubbed my eyes as I rose from my chair. He won't mind waiting a few minutes. I wanted you to tell me what happened to your mother before we end our session. Letting out a light laugh, Addison looked back at me on her journey towards the door. Oh, I never said I'd tell you. She waved as she went through the door, and then she was gone. Harold Evans, with his social anxieties and inability to make eye contact or speak above a whisper, stared at Addison as she passed through the outer office. It was only when I called his name he looked back at me and came in for his session. That's the last of the notes I have from Dr. Chester Bailey, dated ten years ago. Because that's the last time you saw him, wasn't it? Allison nodded. Yep. I heard about what happened to him later. She looked up at me, her lips twisting upwards. Very sad. I held her gaze. You know, Addison, this whole act you've got going on here, it doesn't work with me. She raised an eyebrow. It doesn't, huh? Smiling thinly at her, I shook my head. Not a bit. Standing, I started walking around the therapy room. The sounds of the footfalls were muffled. Every surface was padded with dense foam cushioning, even the floor and the furniture, and Addison's wrists were strapped into padded cuffs, secure to the table she sat at. I didn't think these precautions were necessary, though. Not because she wasn't dangerous, but because I didn't think attacking me fit her profile or her plan. I made a point of turning my back to her as I went on. No, because I know who you are. Or at least I'm starting to. You're in here for attacking a neighbor, right? Bit her thumb off, I understand. Now why would you do that? You're very wealthy. Or at least your grandfather is. And my understanding is you have a trust fund large enough that you could never spend it all. That's the main reason you're here instead of a jail somewhere, right? Your family supposedly pays to get you help instead of getting you locked up. Just like in high school. Just like Dr. Bailey. Nothing but silence behind me. Gripping my hands, I continued... But I have a great deal more resources than poor Dr. Bailey. And I have a greater appreciation than he did for just how dangerous you are. So I've researched you, dug deep, read all the reports, evaluations, 
everything from your elementary school records to your mother's autopsy. I turned around now so I could gauge her reaction. Allison was just watching me placidly, paying attention but seemingly unaffected. I've seen enough that I don't need to ask you those questions, Addison. I don't need to play your games. I'll tell you what happened to your mother and to Dr. Bailey. And after the cards are on the table, maybe we can start from a place of honesty. Or at the very least, respect. Addison smirked slightly. Sounds peachy. Go for it. Sitting back down, I ticked off points on my right hand. Your mother's autopsy showed ligature marks and bruising on her neck and ankles. Her body was found on one of the beds in the storm cellar. The incident report doesn't mention these details, of course, because things were kept intentionally vague to protect you. But it doesn't matter. The first week you were committed here, I went and reviewed the original physical file. Looking at the handful of pictures that were taken after her body was removed, one of those pictures showed the stained mattress where she voided herself as she died. The same bed you described in your little fairy tale as the one she was laying on when you took the box from her. Folding my hands together, I caught her eye again. So what happened is this. You were down there with her for whatever reason. Perhaps she'd gone insane, or perhaps you tricked her down there and got her laid out on the bed somehow. The autopsy didn't show any drugs in her system or any sign of head trauma. So that part is unclear to me. But it's also largely unimportant. What's important is how she died. You were too small to move her or easily kill her when she was awake. But just like now, you were very smart as a little girl. So you waited until she was asleep on that bed. So you waited until she was asleep on that bed. Then you gently tied a sheet around her ankles and to the metal footboard of the bed. Not too tight or she'd wake up. Just tight enough that when she tried to pull free in a panic, it would tighten down more. Then you prepared a second sheet. A noose, really. Because this one you slipped around her neck. Addison was smiling wider now. Her dark gaze unblinking as she studied me. Watching me like I was a stupid animal doing something funny at the zoo. You were only seven at the time. Weighed, what, 50 pounds? Maybe. But you weren't just using your weight to pull the sheet tight around her neck, were you? No, you were braced against the back of the headboard pulling as hard as you could while your mother suffocated to death. You must have been a strong little girl. She nodded her head. I've always been gifted with some degree of natural athleticism. Thank you for noticing. Frowning, I went on. Even if everything I've said so far is true, it could arguably be justifiable. If she was dangerous. If... She really was threatening your life. You could have just been trying to protect yourself. Sighing, I went on. But then we come to Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey, who, by all accounts, was a good man, and based on everything I've looked at, was earnestly trying to help you. Addison lowered her head. Yes, such a shame about him. Such a nice guy. I stood up again, standing over her. No, you don't get to play your game here. You don't get to. She looked up at me. Sit down. I backed up. I had to fight a strong compulsion to do as she asks. Don't you tell me what... Sit down and quit attacking me, please. This is all very distressful and unprofessional, Dr. Bridges. I shuddered as I went to the far corner of the room. I was losing control of this, and I just wanted to be out of the room now. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Turning away for a moment, I forced myself to calm down. She was just a 25-year-old girl with signs of narcissistic sociopathy, not Hannibal Lecter. I had to take the reins back. 
I just couldn't look at her yet. As long as I didn't have to look at her, it would be okay. Harold Evans killed Dr. Bailey during their session one week after your last time meeting with Dr. Bailey. You were scheduled to meet Bailey the hour before the murder for your weekly appointment, but the log says you called and rescheduled it the day before. Why don't you turn around, Doctor? I jumped at her voice. I couldn't turn around. Couldn't meet her eyes. I had to just keep going. But Harold showed up for his appointment. Harold, who had no history of being violent. He was seeing Dr. Bailey for severe anxiety disorder and mild agoraphobia. That man... He tied Dr. Bailey's feet to one end of his desk and nearly pulled his head off with a noose. It's hard to hear you, Doctor. Why don't you show me your face? Shuddering, I began sidestepping for the door. I'm going to help you, Addison, but it's going to take time. You have to be willing to work with me. I held up my card and the door unlocked. That's all for today. I felt my stomach rolling as I opened the door and went out into the hall, narrowly shutting it behind me before I was bent over retching. What was wrong with me? I had to... Get a hold of yourself, Monica. I glared at Dr. Talpin. Richard, don't patronize me. I understand I crossed a line in my initial interview last week but that's no reason to take me off her case. He raised his eyebrows. Monica, it's not my call anymore. Addison filed a complaint. The interview tape was reviewed, and yes, you were too combative for a first session, or a tenth if I'm being honest. But I understand what you're going for, and hell, I might even allow it if things were different. But her grandfather is friends with two of the people on our board. And he's already talked about donating money to the hospital. They're not willing to risk pissing him off. And right now, the best thing I can do is keep you from getting fired. <sighs> I stood up, clenching my fists as I began pacing. Fired? What are we talking about? This girl is dangerous. It is documented that she broke a girl's jaw in high school. It is documented that she bit the thumb off a woman who lived in her apartment building last month. I stopped walking and pinned Richard with my eyes. And all the things I was telling her in our interview? All true. I'm pretty certain that she killed her mother and somehow convinced Harold Evans to kill her last therapist. Talpin rolled his eyes. Look, Monica, this isn't a movie. You aren't a detective. Even if you're right, and that's a really big if, it's not our job. Our job is to assess and treat, that's all. And don't get me wrong, you're a great clinician, one of our best, but taking you off the case is the right move. You've lost sight of priorities here. He looked down at random papers on his desk, as though signaling the end of the conversation through a subtle reminder of his bureaucratic authority. I wasn't done yet. Have you seen how other patients act around her? She's gathering quite the following while she's been here. Looking irritated, Talpin glared back up at me. She's very charismatic. A very pretty young woman who is new to the environment. It's not unexpected that other clients would flock to her. I imagine that'll calm down as the new wears off. Either way, there's nothing sinister about it. I stared at him incredulously. Really? We've had three violent attacks between patients since she's been here. Three! In a month! Before that, we hadn't had one in a year! Looking back down at his paperwork, Talpin began... Monica, you're looking for connections that simply aren't. I cut him off. And by the way, they're patients, not clients. I know all you and the frickin' board care about is money. But 
We're actually responsible for people's lives and well-being here. And I'm telling you, that woman is frickin' dangerous. Talpin struck the desk as he glared up at me. Enough, Dr. Bridges, enough. You're off Addison Hawthorne's treatment team, and that's final. If I hear another word from you, or if I hear you're contacting the girl again, you will quickly realize what it's like when I'm not on your side. Do I make myself clear? Any questions? I was trembling, not from fear or worry, but excitement. The time was almost here. I would finally be able to do my part and show her how worthy I was. No, I got it, Addison. I throw the package over the fence at four in the morning, and then I come back at ten that night and park down the road at the gas station. Not at the gas station. They could have cameras. You park at the ride and share lot down from the station. Oh, no, I'm so friggin' stupid. Now she thinks I can't help. The poor thing's been locked up in that stupid place for two months, and now she's ready to leave, and I can't even get the simplest thing right. Terry, it's all right. You've got this. I trust you. Just breathe. I felt tears spring into my eyes. She was so good to me. She still believed in me, and I wouldn't let her down. Not now, not ever. Thank you. I'll, I'll go to the park and share. I'll, I'll have clothes and money and two burner phones. Is my car going to be big enough? Are we taking anybody else with us? No. The others will have to find their own way. The risk is too great otherwise. There was a pause and then... I have to go. I'm using someone else's phone account. And they apparently don't have many minutes. See you tomorrow night. I held the phone to my ear for several seconds after it clicked and fell silent. Everything was prepared and now I just had to wait, which of course was the hardest part. Sighing discontentedly, I shifted the phone to my other hand, sitting it down on one of my moving boxes. Instead, it slipped from my grasp and clattered to the floor. Stupid, Terry, stupid. I still wasn't used to the thumb being gone. I had already broken a plate and two glasses. That way, during packing, the last thing I needed to do was mess up my phone, especially with everything going on. Bending down to pick it up, I let out a relieved breath when I saw it was okay. I laughed shakily as I sat the phone down with my good hand. I just needed to calm down. Everything would be fine. This was Addison's plan, after all. It would work just so long as I did my part. I looked over at the cardboard box sitting apart from my belongings. Addison said there was more things to go in it, but the first one was already sitting on top. The small metal box drew me to it whenever I thought about it. And with a twinge of guilt... I walked over and touched it again. I had a familiar impulse to trigger the button on the side and lift it to my eyes, but I wouldn't. I couldn't. Addison said it wasn't for me, at least not yet. I checked the time, eight hours until I needed to throw the package over the fence, 26 until I needed to be ready and waiting for Addison. I wanted to go right now and be waiting just so I'd be ready. But I knew that was stupid. I might draw attention that way. Instead, I just kept packing and then go and get some sleep. I looked down at the mottled stub where my thumb used to be. I needed to remember to take my antibiotics, too. Hopefully this round would finish off the infection, because I did not want to have another surgery. But no, I needed to stop being so negative. It would all be okay. And besides... Nothing great ever came without sacrifice. Even all the people that are going to die. Is that okay? It had been some time since I heard that small, meek voice in the back of my head. Some vestige of who I had been before meeting Addison. Before coming to understand things. It was a weak, scared voice. 
that wanted me to doubt myself, to fail Allison. I spoke aloud when I responded to the thought, my voice echoing strangely in the increasingly empty apartment. Yes, even that. The path is a razor that bleeds you until you finish it or it finishes you. Part 4 I could see the hazy glow of orange in the night sky as I waited in the rideshare parking lot for Addison. The hospital, or at least part of it, was burning. The fire would eat eight patients, including one I would soon find out was named Janet Oberman. Out of the patients in the women's ward of the hospital, Janet was the one that most closely met Addison's criteria. First, she was similar in build and age to Allison herself. Secondly, she had no one that came to visit her. Third, her intake bag contained only her purse, cell phone, and car keys, but credit cards that were not set to expire for another few months. I knew all this because Addison knew all this, because the people she had befriended during her two months' stay at the asylum both a custodian and an orderly had been shown a new path for their life. And as I could assess from the personal experience, once Addison showed you that path, there was very little you wouldn't do to walk it by her side. The package I had chucked over the fence earlier had looked from the outside like little more than a duct tape beach towel wadded up into something approaching the size and shape of a basketball. But it was what was inside that ball that mattered. A burner phone, a book of matches, and a plastic glue bottle partially filled with lighter fluid, as well as a small bag of Addison's blood. I had not even made it back to the car before I saw the shadowy figure of the custodian coming out to collect the package. The plan was simple. All patients had to be in their rooms by 9 p.m. Doors were locked at 9.30, and the lights went out at 10. That was the routine of the hospital. And routine is very important in such places as that. Except tonight, the routine would be disrupted. Janet Oberman would be taken to Addison's room instead of her own. Once there, she'd be struck in the head with a bookend that had been taken from Janet's own room. Then she would be set on fire. The bookend itself would be clean before being smeared with Addison's blood, which had been in my refrigerator next to the tofu for the last two months, and discarded back in Janet's room, which, as luck would have it, was on a different hall that would be likely to be untouched by the fire. The rooms near Addison's wouldn't be so lucky. The plan was to burn all eight of the rooms on that hall, so Addison didn't Call special attention. There would be a knife from the kitchen used to wound or kill the other patients. And like that, the bookend, the matches, and the glue bottle filled with lighter fluid would be left in Janet's room when it was all done. Eight people would die that night, and another five would escape. I worried what might happen if one of them was caught. They wouldn't know all the details but they would know that Addison was still alive, that it was Janet Oberman's body that lay twisted and smoldering in her room. But I forced my doubts aside. They wouldn't betray Addison any more than I would, and if they did, what did it matter? The ravings of lunatics in the face of physical evidence. Addison's family demanding the remains immediately and the ongoing proof that Janet Oberman was alive and out in the world. Because Addison was bringing Janet's purse with her, the orderly would have gotten it from the patient's intake storage room and given it to her before the back gate. After I dropped Addison off, I would take the purse and drive south for three days, making sure to use the cards in, out of way places once every few hours. As long as I kept my face and damaged hand out of the cameras, it shouldn't be hard to give the impression that Janet, after killing Addison and several of her fellow patients, 
had escaped and was slowly traveling south towards the border. When Addison had told me about the plan two months earlier, I was worried. What if I got caught? What if they checked Janet's body for DNA or dental records? What if somebody made a mistake? She had listened to my questions patiently before replying. If I got caught, I was to say that I had been paid by a woman matching Janet's description to use the cards for a few days while she traveled in a different direction. They might charge me with theft, but it wouldn't go anywhere. As for the rest, Addison said that everything could be taken care of. Had been. There would be no autopsy or detailed examination of the body before it was turned over to her grandfather. No security footage and no investigation into why the accelerant seemed to match gasoline much more closely than the l small amount of lighter fluid in Janet's room. As for the rest, Addison just laughed. Danger and uncertainty are always going to be there, Terry. I know you're not there yet, but once you reach the point on the path that you can fully embrace it as the gift that it is, the fear and worry fall away. All that is left is your will. We'd been sitting on my sofa at the time, moments away from some of the worst pain I'd ever had in my life. I had smiled and nodded. I know it's just some hard times. I worry that I'll mess something up. Addison watched me silently for a moment before standing up. Did I ever tell you my father was an archer? I shook my head. Yeah, he was. Not professional, of course. I think the only thing he did professionally was spend my mother's money. But he would practice a lot and do all the occasional tournament. I don't remember a lot about him, but I remember one time, just a few months before he died, he tried to show me how to shoot a bow. Addison had stepped back from the sofa and gone into an archer's stance, left arm straight as she drew back an invisible bowstring. She looked at some unknown distant target as she went on. He told me that the trick to making the hard shots was not to think about it. Don't worry about it. The bow was just a platform for your desire. The arrow was the important part because it carried your will. Not your thoughts or your doubts, but something purer, something higher. He didn't realize the arrow wondered if it would hit. You'd already decided it would hit. You released it simply to force reality to conform itself to what you already knew to be true. Allison had broken her stance and looked back down at me, wiping her left eye with the back of her hand. He was a bit drunk at the time and I don't think that he expected me to get it at such a young age, but I understood very well. Crouching down next to me, she grabbed my hand tightly. This path that we're traveling is something pure and higher, too, and we survive it by living without fear, without doubt, without hesitation. She yanked my hand forward as she opened her mouth. Pain exploded up my arm as she began biting through my thumb, yanking her head back and forth so violently that as she backed up I fell off the sofa. I could distantly hear myself screaming, but my mind was focused on getting it over with. I turned my body so I could brace it against Addison's as she grinded down between the bones and yanked again. I saw my vision go red, then white. One last forceful tug, and the pain changed. The feeling of pressure was gone, replaced with the hot shock of damaged nerves screaming in the open air as blood pulsed out onto the rug. Then Addison was beside me. I think she must have swallowed my thumb, 
as I didn't see it anywhere. And she was talking to me clearly, telling me it would be all right as she put one of the towels we had prepared against the wound. She said I needed to stay with her at least long enough to call 911. I had numbly agreed, though I don't remember what I told the operator or the police when they arrived. The next memory I had was two days later in the hospital. I'd woken up in a panic, worried that something had gone wrong, that they'd hurt Allison somehow instead of just taking her to the institution like she wanted. It was a foolish worry, and not at all Beck. I let out a small scream as Addison opened the back door and climbed into the seat behind me. I met her eyes in the rearview mirror. You scared me. She let out a laugh. I could tell. Give me a second to change clothes before we get going. She opened up the duffel bag I'd brought and changed out of the smoky-smelling green scrub she'd been wearing. Those went into a large, sealable garment bag that we'd dispose of after we left the area. As she was pulling on her shirt, she glanced back up at me. Did you get the burner phone? I nodded. Yes, it's in the glove compartment. Addison squeezed my shoulder. Good job. Now let's head to the drop-off point. After that, start out on Janet's last wild ride. I laughed. I'll feel like a spy in a movie. She grinned as she laid down in the back seat. Super Agent Terry, just make sure you're back in five days, okay? Remember, you're my movie director, too. My smile fell away. I remember I was dreading this part, though I knew I was just being weak, trying to hide my dismay. I raised my fist as we pulled out of the parking lot. <laughs> That's right. Lights, camera, action. Oh, God, why are you doing this? The old gymnasium smelled of stagnant water and disuse. And at the edge of our light, I saw several small, furtive shifts in the shadows I suspected were rats. Shuddering, I looked down at the bound, naked man sitting on the floor before me. He had been crying and whining for the last half hour, ever since Mr. Paul and Mr. Soto, his former patient and employee, respectively, had roughly stripped him down and bound him. Every time he complained, one of them struck him, but it only cured the noise for a short while. It was like a geyser of fear in him that had to erupt every few minutes, no matter the price. I felt around in my heart for any pity for him, but thankfully I found none. Dr. Tolpin, you're only making this harder on yourself. You should be savoring these last few moments of peace before filming begins. The woman, Dr. Bridges, looked up at me with dejected anger before glancing at the man. You might as well save your breath, Richard. They're under her control. We have no chance of persuading them. Either we fight or... Her head rocked back as I slapped her across the face. You need to be quiet, too. There's no fighting this, and I've seen your notes. You should be grateful to be part of something like this, after all. Particularly how you treated Allison. Eyes watering, Bridges looked back up at me. Why don't you get Allison out here so we can talk to her directly? Try to make amends. Talpin looked at Bridges incredulously. Addison? Addison is dead, you stupid bitch. If anyone is behind this, it's Janet. I almost left it alone. But all of this was going to have to be removed from the final movie anyway. I didn't want talk of Addison or my voice on the disc we left behind. And if it was only going to be a director's cut, I might as well have my fun too. I'm afraid you're the stupid bitch, Dr. Talpin. Janet's all burned up. I enjoyed watching his eyes go wide as he started to understand. He began sniveling again, which earned him another hard slap from the orderly's beefy hand, turning back to Bridges. And as for you, you don't get to talk to her again. 
She's not even here. You're not worth her time. She lowered her gaze as the last of hope left her eyes. Suddenly, she started stammering to Talpin. Richard, she's the only one that can call this off. If we don't escape, we... Her words cut off as I kicked her in the ribs. Enough of that. Get up. It's showtime. Paul and Soto yanked them to their feet and began shoving the pair of our small circle of light under one of the rusting basketball hoops out to our main stage. I stopped the camera and then started back under a new file. It would make editing easier, and I wanted to capture the scene before the pair changed it with their screams and blood. It wasn't anything fancy. A thin mattress covered by clear tarps, all of it highlighted by a pair of powerful spotlights. But it was simple, simple and beautiful, full of potential. I felt my breath quickening as Soto pulled the pair into the light. I'd been afraid of being too squeamish for this job, but instead I was excited, anxious to get started. Talbin looked towards me and let out a low moan as Bridges began to cry softly. I stepped closer, making sure my phone's camera stayed in focus. I didn't want to miss capturing a single moment. Addison said it had to be clear enough that whoever watched it wouldn't think it was just a low-budget horror m movie. What if no one ever watches it, especially sticking it in another movie's Blu-ray case? Addison smiled at me, her eyes dancing. Now that it was three weeks since she'd been out of the hospital, and she had never looked more radiant. At least part of that was because she was so happy with the job I'd done on the movie, and I felt so excited and proud that I might have burst. She'd taken it a few days earlier to encode it with what she called special magic, so she'd be alerted as soon as it was played on pretty much anything connected to the internet. When she brought it back today, it was in the disc case of a sci-fi movie, Independence Day. I was already worried that the movie might go to waste, that the whole box might go to waste if no one ever found it. But like always, Addison wasn't worried. She'd already decided what was going to happen. Now it was just a matter of making it so. It'll be watched, Terry. Don't worry about that. Addison pulled out a sealed plastic bag. Inside, I could see several small Halloween toys that looked like they'd been smeared with blood. She handed me the bag. These go in the box near the bottom. On top of this. My breath caught as she took out the old skin-bound book from her bag. I felt an electric charge go through me as I touched it, and I found myself wanting to ask her if it was okay if I read more of it before putting it in the box. But I already knew the answer. The book wasn't for me any longer, at least not for now. Still, I couldn't help but voice one last worry. What if the book gets lost or destroyed? My blood froze as Addison's gaze changed. Your questions and doubts are starting to get tiresome, Terry. Do you doubt the plan? Do you doubt me? I wanted to answer, but I felt as though my throat was constricting to a pinhole. Why wouldn't she stop looking at me? I was so sorry I made her angry. If she'd just stop. She looked away and I sucked in a breath. I used it the next second to say how sorry I was. That, of course, I didn't doubt her plan. I just knew how valuable the book was. I was being foolish. Smiling, she turned back to me and stroked my cheek. It's okay, Terry. Just let it be the last time. Shifting her gaze back to the back seat, she regarded the cardboard box. Everything else already in there? I nodded. I put everything else in before, and... Swallowing, I went on. I put the box of shadows inside this morning. Allison frowned for a moment. 
It's almost right, but it's still missing something. She glanced at me. Do you have a pen or something? Digging in my purse, I came up with a black marker I'd been using to mark moving boxes. I glanced at the dash clock as I handed it to her. 4.30. I had to hurry up. This was the last day of my lease's early termination period, and the rest of my stuff had already been moved. I needed to get the box into Addison's old storage unit tonight, or I'd call attention trying to get back into the building after I'd supposed to be fully moved out. But Allison didn't have much left to do. Leaning over the seat, she scrawled two words on the side of the box. Private Valuables. Handing me the pen back, she leaned over and planted a kiss on my forehead, making me giggle as she got out of the car. Leaning back in, she looked at me seriously. Be careful, and then go to the gathering place we planned. Remember, this is just the beginning. Tipping me a wink, she added, We still have much work to do, yes? So quoth, This raven. My darlings, I hope you enjoyed this story as much as I did. It looks like there may be more. Perhaps we can encourage our dear author. I hope I haven't offended anyone with my poor Tennessee Williams accent, but the first part just kind of reminded me of Southern Gothic, so I went with it. Thank you so much for coming and listening to me, and a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Ermin Case, Darren and Jennifer, and Laura. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to Come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs>